Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the British Chambers of Commerce International Women's Day panel. I'd like to start by saying we're in a very privileged position here today being able to celebrate International Women's Day. And our thoughts are with the women in Ukraine who don't have this freedom today. So I would like to welcome our panellists this morning. Uh, we've got a great list of people for you and I will let them introduce themselves and say a little bit about them and then we'll go into our discussions. We want to have a conversation today. Women are good storytellers and women respond to good stories. So that's what we want to do and really talk about what we've done and where we're going and what we think really the future is for women and why language matters so very, very much. So if I just quickly go around the room, um, Claire, would you like to introduce yourself please? Sure. Hi, it's great to be here today. I'm Claire Mason. I'm the founder and CEO of Man Bites Dog, which is a global thought leadership consultancy. And we've done an awful lot of work in this area on what we call the gender say gap, which is all about women being seen and heard in business and public life. And also the gender news gap, looking at how diversity in journalism shapes how we see the world. Thank you. Eva. Hi, thank you very much for having me today. I'm uh, Eva Helena Rundskog. I am a Norwegian and I'm the CEO and co-founder of a uh, ocean tech company called Sapphos Ocean Sense. I'm also the uh, board member of the British Norwegian Chamber of Commerce. And uh, I and the company in Sapphos Ocean Sense work to promote and to empower uh, communities and local farmers everywhere around the globe uh, to provide equality uh, in circular economy and uh, to uh, to level out the uh, uh, the um, cultural balances in terms of uh, of the finance so thank you very much for having me today thank you liz thanks Sarah. morning everybody um, i'm liz claydon i'm um, a partner in our um, in kpmg i run our deal advisory practice and i'm a member of our exco um, not surprising, therefore, I spent, after a small, small stint in audit, I spent most of my career advising on transactions, um, small and big, private equity, big global corporates, spent most of that from a sector perspective in both consumer markets and retail sector, and luckily more in the life sciences sector. Fantastic. And finally, Fiona. Hi everybody, lovely to be here. Thanks Sarah for inviting me. Um, my name is Fiona Carney and I am the COO for Microsoft in Western Europe. Um, I've been very passionately involved with diversity, inclusion and allyship over the last number of years. Um, I've led our, our council over in Asia where I've been based for the last five years. Um, also vice president on the British Chamber of Commerce in Singapore. Um, and I've just relocated back to this part of the world, to Europe. And uh, yeah, really looking forward to the conversation today. Fabulous. Thank you very much. OK, so language matters. And as many of you should know, we've had a campaign at the British Chambers of Commerce to make a very, very small change. At the moment in Companies House, the standard articles of association that any company takes um, when they set up refers to chairman and we feel that this is archaic and it needs to change and it is a barrier it's a very very small change um, that will make a big difference so we've centered our campaign around how around how important language is so my first question and I'll start with Claire is why does language matter and how have you changed your use of language in the workplace to create a gender neutral environment so fundamentally, language matters because it's about how we're represented. Language shapes how we divide up the world, how we think, and language therefore has the power to either reinforce or challenge stereotypes. And in the case you mentioned with chairman, it's fundamentally reinforcing that stereotype. Words like businessman, chairman, statesman, tell more than half the population that we don't belong in business, and we don't belong in politics by making male the default, by making it the norm and by making us the exception. And what's particularly important about this is how it shapes how children see the world and children's opportunities. There are lots of fantastic studies. I think my favorite is one called Drawing the Future, where children are asked every year to draw how they see themselves in the future and what that career might look like. And when they're four, equal numbers of uh, girls and boys draw astronauts and scientists and all the adventurers and all these exciting things. By the time they're seven, both girls and boys start to gender what they can do when they grow up. 
Um, and so actually words like this actually affect whether we can see ourselves in these careers and women are, therefore start aspiring to be teachers which is great but we don't want them to only aspire to be teachers and they stop aspiring to business and they stop aspiring to science and what that means is that currently in the education system we've got four times as many boys as girls aspiring to stem careers as they get older with the consequence that women are held back and we've got this enormous stem skills back uh, stem skills gap which is costing the UK economy 28 billion in lost GDP every year so language really matters and I think the other thing that really matters is the is the fact that this is an issue it's very easy to say this isn't important there are other priorities for government at the moment but I have here um, a fantastic a uh, piece of work uh, which has been discovered by my colleague Kirstine Mackay's grandmother Jill, who knew we were very interested in this subject and it's called Images of Equality, Images of Inequality by the TUC. So you can tell from the haircuts on the cover here, this is from 1984. I remember that haircut. <laughs> I think we all had one, didn't we? And in here is a style guide and it's a recommended guide to more inclusive and equal language. And it has words like chairman, manpower, policeman, and all of these kind of things that exclude women. And at the time the government said it wasn't a priority, there are other things on the agenda, it's not urgent. So if not now, when, when are we gonna change this? Because it affects how we see the future and it affects kids and their aspirations for what they can be in the future. Yeah, and so much has changed. My father was a policeman in 1984, and now we have police officers. So there is change happening. Liz, can I bring you in? Because I know you've done a lot at, at KPMG. Yeah, look, I mean, Claire's made a lot of great points there. So, like, so I won't repeat those, Sarah. But I mean, what I would say is, I mean, it, language definitely matters. I think we can all relate to many examples. And actually, I'm, I'm proud that actually we reviewed the role of chair. Um, I think it was two and a half years ago now, Sarah, where we actually moved um, moved there and then to, to replace chairman with chair, when at that point we did have a male in the chair. Um, as you know now, we, we don't, which is great, and Bina is now our chair, but um, but we we absolutely feel, feel absolutely like that. Um, I think there is also, um, I would also say from my experience of working in a pretty male-dominated environment um, in deal advisory for, for the last 20 years, um, Often when you're around the table with a bunch of men, you know, at the start of kickoff meetings and deals, etc. When when people start the meetings by come on then guys, let's get going, it does make you feel different. Quite often as the only female in that environment, I do remember thinking, I'm not a guy, and I know it's just just the terminology. So I think just being really conscious of that inclusivity, exclusivity, sorry, you know, not inclusion. Um, is, uh, is, is the other thing. And then the, that's probably the final thing I would say, Sarah, is, is I think quite often um, building on what uh, Claire said, you know, women can feel um, that they almost apologise quite often. I don't know if you've seen this when, you know, I had an, an, an executive sister working for me recently and every time she'd speak to me at the screen, oh, sorry, Liz, sorry, I know you're really busy. And I was like, stop apologising. You've got something really relevant to say. So I think, whereas now I'm working with a male equivalent, he never apologises. So I think it is that um, some really interesting perspectives that I think we just all need, need to be aware of. And it's I not just, it's, sorry, <laughs> sorry. On, I, say, I, I think it's a particular problem as well when it's accompanied by an image. So you often get the government will be on the news and it will say the prime minister was addressing a room of businessmen. And often it is mainly men in the picture and you get that picture of universal blue suits. And I, I think it may have been Norway where that was it Norway or Iceland where I think everyone called themselves Peter for a day because there were more Peters at the top of businesses than women. Yeah, <laughs> Arna, they call themselves. Yeah. Oh, no. Brilliant. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not just about a message to the young women coming through. It's a message to everybody. It's to the men as well. And the non-binary people in, in business, that it's not a man's role to take, that it's it's a role there for everybody. So it, it is so very, very important. And it's almost, it, it seems strange we're even discussing it, to be perfectly honest, because it's so, so blindingly obvious, but it, it's clearly still needs to be discussed. Okay, so leading on from that, um, language is so it's not, I know I'm banging on about it because obviously it's very close to my heart. It's not just about chair man. It's about the language used about ourselves. And, and Liz, you started to, to mm. really lead towards that. Do you think the language that we use in senior leadership roles, 
that we use about our side cells implies imposter syndrome. And do you think it can be a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy? What, what do we need to do ourselves about the language that we use? Um, Eva, let's come to you first on that. Uh, um, thank you, Sarah. Well, it's, it's quite interesting because it's, it's rooted in, uh, in, in old established truths, obviously. And um, as, a, as an example, here in Norway, we have something called uh, Jamteloven. It's kind of the, the law of Jamte, if you may, which basically is a poem of 10 rules that says uh, that you shall not take a space or believe that you are better than anyone else. Uh, you shall not talk about your success. Uh, by any means, um, and those are like the, the general rules for everyone. So to understand the cultural aspect of this, us as Norwegians are normally quite humble in how we flaunt ourselves to others as a general rule. Um, however, men do break that rule quite often um, and are considered to be strong business leaders whilst doing it. You know, they brag about their success and how they created the success. Um, and take the credit, uh, whilst women, however, are considered to be bragging and overselling their own efforts whilst doing it. So it's a completely different perspective on how we view it and how the, uh, also in terms of the language that we use, um, even though it's the exact same thing. So, so it's quite interesting. Um, yeah, it's, but and it's, it's, it's things like, um, I, I used to refer myself, I, I used to apologise for being assertive, say, oh, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just bossy, what can I say? Yeah. And I have managed to get myself out, that was a long time ago, mm. and it is that self-fulfilling, and now I'm seen as a bossy woman, not as an assertive woman who's doing what she should be doing. Yes, exactly, and ultimately, you know, that imposter syndrome does create an effect, perhaps more on trying to balance out the laws and opinions within the company, you know, as a, as a female leader because you don't want to be a boss you want to be a leader and that's a, two very separate things and um uh, and i think that to be a good leader you need to have yeah you know you need to be a team player and yeah i Absolutely. think the clue is to have compassion and understanding and sharing the success with the team because as a leader you are nothing without a good team you, you know you, basically you're nothing um, so to balance it out uh, as a team player is, is, um, is important, but you also need to be firm and to make clear decisions that not always are the popular ones, but nevertheless the right ones for the company and then ultimately the team. So it's a, it's a continuous, you know, um, balancing act, I would say, where you don't, um, um, you know, expose yourself too much for the success, but, you know, uh, sharing it with the team. But, but it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a difficult thing because it's so different from how men normally does it. Absolutely. Liz, can I bring you back in? Yeah, no, I think um, I would just get pretty much build on what I said before on that in terms of the kind of, um, we, we did some work actually, and Sarah, you will have seen this on the, um, on the social, socio um, diversity within, within the board and, um, and the executive. And, and we got into actually some quite tricky language water where actually we were trying to define what we were trying to show is that actually quite a lot of the senior leadership, the partners and the board and the exec actually were from, um, you know, working class families. And what I mean by that is in the definition of the world that we grew up in where we didn't have professional parents. Um, but actually the way it got defined actually made started to make people feel quite um, embarrassed about their backgrounds actually. And so we ended up having really a lot of debate about how do you actually define what working class is? And actually what I thought Bina did brilliant is, is just got on the front foot about it and actually made people feel comfortable. I'm talking about within our business, within our partnership and say, look, we're trying to role model greater socio you know, diversity coming through our business and, and it not always being from the same universities, the same, we've got lots of school leavers programs, but making sure we use the right language, but then got everyone really comfortable around that was, was harder, if I'm honest, than maybe we thought when we, when we sort of started on the journey. Mm, absolutely. I did, um, I, my first job was at KPMG as a junior secretary when I was 19. And um, I went back and did a piece for the alumni magazine um, about 18 months, two years ago. And that could never have happened 30 years ago because yeah. everyone seemed to be a, a, a graduate from a, a very good university and there wasn't that diversity. So women weren't able to progress. And I was the first non-graduate consultant that, that we had. 
Yeah. And to see how that has progressed in amazing. And 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 the and the benefit we've got within the business. If you actually speak mm. to our, our people in the business, I mean they're really proud of what we've done there. So it was actually it's really interesting, Sarah, your point, because really we needed to get the partners more comfortable, but actually the benefit we've had and how now that's attracting a different type of talent into the business where you know is, is coming through really strongly. Hmm. Thank you. Okay, so let's let's move on now. So we, we talk about the barriers that others put up that affects our ability to progress. And which barriers have been the hardest to face head on, overcome and really smash? Um, Fiona, let's come to you on this one. Yeah, look, I mean, I, I think we have so many different barriers, but often actually the biggest barrier is ourselves, I think sometimes and, and ourselves getting in our way. And, and I think, you know, the whole discussion around imposter syndrome, not feeling good enough, not feeling like we can do what we believe you know we really want to do is something that I, I think is a barrier as well and something that I think we really need to work hard at trying to manage and often we have that negative self-talk you know so I, I really encourage people to think about how do you get away for, from that and even in the language actually I often uh, hear women saying you know I'm looking after versus I lead or I'm responsible for, you know, so it, it's some of that softer language and, and maybe sometimes we need to be a little bit more deliberate in that. Um, what I've seen a lot more recently, and I think this is something that really is helping to build confidence is this concept around empathetic leadership. And I think we've all heard that coming in into the workforce so much more. And females and, and often males as well, females can be very empathetic. And I think it's something that we should really hold on to and display more. Um, in Microsoft, we've actually evolved our leadership principles. So we have, we have a set of leadership principles that we try and, and live and behave by. And they're around model, coach and care. And I think it's been really interesting to see the impact that adding that care piece has brought in to, to actually helping people to smash through some of those barriers. Um, it means that our responsibility as leaders is well beyond just business results, but it's also around coaching and developing and also caring for others. So I think um, challenging the assumptions is, is something that's important for us to do. I often ask why not versus why when it comes to things like promotions, why wouldn't we promote them versus why are we? Um, and I think in terms of breaking some of those barriers, sponsors are particularly important. And I think that's, it's really critical to have somebody who is there to speak up for you, who is around the table, who has a voice and who can help clear some of that pathway. So there's some of the things, but, but I would say, first off, we've got to unblock our own barriers that can sometimes get in the way with that imposter syndrome and that negative self-talk and work through that using our networks, using sponsors, um, and really trying to make sure that we have the support we need around us. I, I think often my mom always used to say, you know, guilt is a wasted emotion. And I find myself sometimes as women, we're trying to do absolutely everything. And I have certainly tried to live by that and say, where do I need support? How am I going to get it? Whether it's family, friends, or if, if you need to pay for it, which obviously we need to at many times so that we can actually help ourselves break through some of those barriers. Absolutely. And I think we, as, as leaders, we have a responsibility as well to make it clear that um, life isn't perfect. And you have, I always say, I've got three areas. I've got, I've got my family, my work, my home. God knows where I come into the equation, but I'm somewhere down the list. And I can do two of those really well. One would be failing. Usually, hopefully it's the home. Um, but you do make mistakes and you do have to pick up and it's OK to make mistakes. Yeah. And yeah. that we do make mistakes and, and we're nothing. Sorry, I don't mean this derogatory. We're nothing special. We are just women who are doing what we do. And we've, we've, we've seized the opportunity and we've gone on and we've, we've taken it further. But it's amazing yeah. how many women don't realise that, that they have it within themselves to move forward and to seize the day. The, the role modelling is just so important. And to just bring it down to basics and to share some of those stories and not try and be the perfect professional all the time I think sharing and talking about it is is important and I saw one of the comments there from somebody sponsors are there you're so mm -hmm. right mentors help you sponsors are there to talk about you and to really lift you up and I think that they play a critical role for us in terms of, of progression and just providing that platform absolutely but 
and and I also uh, to to add to that, I think I think a, a a big part of that, as as you both said, is is you know the biggest barrier is ourselves. But uh, from my experience, I I noticed that the more barriers I put um, in terms of who is invited into my sphere or not, the uh, the more comfortable it became and, and the bigger space I could take. Mm. And the result is the more respected I became. Yeah. So, so it's, it's about creating your own safe uh, uh, barrier around you and then be, being allowed to take that space. Um, and I think that's important as well. Yeah. And I, I would just, I'd just build on that as well um, on the, to me, the word we haven't used much yet today is confidence. I think we've all mm. sort of alluded to it, but I think it's, and I was really interested in what you said earlier about, you know, the culture of Norway and not sort of bragging basically about how good we, you know, you are. But, but then I think women can sometimes tee the other way. And, and therefore what we do a lot in terms of the coaching and mentoring and sponsorship and role model is really bringing out, you know, enabling, um, you know, really talent that we've got in the business to feel more confident and do that actually by putting them into situations. So I think we all know that, you know, certain situations can be daunting standing on a stage in front of, you know, a room full 80% men, et cetera, et cetera. But the earlier you do it in your career, and I think we've probably all learned by, experience here the, the more you actually just do get confident with it and then that Absolutely. I think once you're showing a level of confidence <laughs> and impact I was thinking around the what was the barriers for me in the early part of my career I was always quite young um, and often with people more senior than me in in in, in boardrooms etc um, and I really needed to push myself to build my confidence and, and find my voice and once I started doing that I you know it made it made a huge difference. Absolutely. And, and it doesn't go away. I did my first um, national news interview last year and I said, yeah, of course I'll do it. Not a problem. Scary. And then half an hour, I think, what the hell am I doing to myself? Why am I doing this? What am I going to say? I'm bound to say the wrong thing. I'm bound to swear against all that stuff. And then did it and it was fine. But equally, being self-critical as a woman, um, I, I then watched it back, which I don't do very often. And all I saw was that my necklace was squiffy. I didn't hear what I was saying. I just saw that I had a squiffy necklace. And that is a very female thing. And we have to, and I've, I've made a conscious effort now to ignore things like that and just concentrate on the content. And I think we're really bad at that. And also, again, admitting we're bad, at admitting we suffer from that, like everyone else does, make, gives people more confidence to go and put themselves forward. Definitely, also, I think sorry quite clear go on I'm gonna rant so you carry on I was gonna say that inner critic you talk about is is such a barrier and I think building on what everybody said like starting with Fiona about holding ourselves back it's just so critical um we've done lots of work on the gender say gap and the the, the fact is women are now disproportionately the experts in the room we're more likely to have a university degree we're more likely to have a professional career and yet when you look at the news and when you look at conferences we're outnumbered four to one at conferences as keynotes speakers and through the pandemic this gender say gap in the media has got worse we're now outnumbered five to one on major rolling news programs and a lot of that is because the government had for example six months of covid briefings fronted entirely by men so all of that work they'd invested in getting women into stem careers is put back by decades by that sort of behavior and i think this gender say gap is really important and getting over our fear of failure so sarah you talked about you know making yourself do a media interview and i think in order to close this gender say gap and have these visible female role models we're all going to have to make ourselves do things and that's why events like today are so important i think public speaking you know many people think they'd rather die than get on a stage mm. and public speak and it's horrible isn't it it makes you feel sick it makes you feel nervous and then afterwards your inner critic really goes for it but i think what we have to do is just pretend it's like learning a language and just make ourselves do it and build the skill you know it's a skill like any other i actually went on a course where we went to speaker's corner and we were the only women in speaker's corner and we stood on a wobbly ladder and said our piece as the as the critics like threw vegetables at us and had a go <laughs> and, and nothing they said was anywhere near as bad as how we were speaking to ourselves internally you know that sort of inner critic piece so I, I do think I would really encourage women to get trained in public speaking and just do it because it does get easier and you do get less subconscious over time because you know, we, we need you, we need to hear you, and we need to see you to inspire yeah. the next generation. The BBC did a great project, um, which is a 50-50 project, 
to try and get to 50. I, might, I must add, actually, our BCC conference, we always have a very, very good balanced um, panel selection because we've got a, a very good balanced um, network. So it's not everywhere, but I, I fully appreciate that. And I also, I, I'm aware that sometimes I'm asked to be in a panel because I am a woman. And so I'm representing women. Um, and I used to have a problem with that. But now I've got to the point now where if I am, if it's perfectly valid, if I know what I'm talking about, perfect valid to be on it, I will take the fact they've picked me to do it because I'm female, because we need to be there. What do other people feel about that? Fiona, what, what do you feel about that? Look, I, I think we should take every opportunity and it's back to that role modeling piece, to be honest, if we're not going to do it, who is? Um, mm -hmm. I think, you know, Claire, what you were mentioning, I think it was, it was Claire, super interesting about the, how big um, the media plays a role and, and equally people like communications directors and people working in communications in, in companies across the world. I had an amazing uh, comms director in Asia and she used to be so mindful of who was going to be on stage or in a communication or representing across diversity not only female and male but culture style various other elements too and we need that thought we need that representation so my view is take every opportunity I'm a big believer that people should just say yes immediately and then figure out how they how they go with the flow and and challenge themselves a little bit and i think it's super important there i think i said yes to everything for a whole year which got me into all sorts of scrapes i remember i did a feminist swearing night paid for by the finnish government once and just all sorts of crazy things where i had to rap which was terrible but i did it and i think you can kind of like that's a good way of facing your fears and, and to your point fiona i think if we can um when you're asked to speak on diversity, I will sometimes ask to speak on, you know, I've spoken on trade for the British Chambers of Commerce or something like that. I will often try and take something that's all about diversity and ask if I can speak on another business topic and kind of broaden it out because otherwise we end up with these ghettos where you're only asked to speak to almost represent an identity you're seen to come from. And also I always try and recommend other diverse speakers as well, which can really help. But I so agree with you, say yes to everything, make yeah. yourself do it. <laughs> Um, Aaron, who is our chief exec in Italy, I'm, I'm assuming it's that Aaron, um, who's a, a wonderful chief exec, has asked a question about sometimes do you feel that politically correct language can become cumbersome and unnatural, which particularly for someone who's dealing with it in, as your, your second language. And, and my answer to that would, would always be as long as you don't mind being corrected. And mm -hmm. if we're not precious about it and I, I would always correct someone if they call me chairman because that is not my title. But I'm not prissy about it. I just say, actually, no, my, my, my title is chair. And I think that subtle way of doing it so people learn because there's, there, there is a lot of change. And I, I, what, what do you think about that, Liz? Yeah, I, I, I could not agree more, Sarah. It, it sort of comes back to the point I made before about confidence, doesn't it? Yeah. which is your, what you're saying there is I'm confident to just be clear what my role is and what, 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 what I feel comfortable about it being called. And, and I think um, I can think of a number of situations where, you know, we all, we'll work in, in, you know, diverse cultural, cultural environments as well as, you know, um, in our own home market and also work with lots of different um, cultures in our teams. And there's lots of times in meetings where I've not met someone before and I see the name, you know, 30 seconds before the meeting starts and I'm kind of not sure how to pronounce it. As long as you're respectful, and as long as you, you know, ask or you have a go and then say, was that was that right? What I find is people are absolutely fine with it. It's where you're in situations where you've seen it the other way, where people just get it continually get it wrong. And and and, and you know, I'm not going to make this about males or females, but but sometimes you can see the you know. Whereas if you're not being corrected, people can then come back to this point about very quickly feeling feeling excluded from the conversation, or people just not caring enough to check in and make sure they've got it right. Absolutely, yeah. So Aaron, just keep going the way you are because you're brilliant, <laughs> and you. Um, we and um, as long as you learn, then that that's all we ask, isn't it? Okay. So we've talked about gender diversity on boards, and what about the power of gen of diversity in general? And again, an obvious question, but why is it so important to ensure we have diverse representation on boards? And what and how does this positively impact the bottom line of a business? Now, I know that Fiona, you've got some great information on this. 
Yeah, look, I mean, I, I think there's an element around boards, but also just in general. And when I think about or any type of organization, we need to reach our consumers and, and the people who are purchasing from us in every part of, of the market. We need to be able to reflect what they're looking for in our products, in our services, in, in what we're trying to come to the market with, but also to have it represented within our workforce. And I think there is some really compelling data out there. Um, the global spending power of women is 30, 32 trillion dollars i mean just even to think about how big a number that is and the global spending power of lgbtqia plus consumers is 3.9 trillion um hispanic and latino community is 1.9 trillion and we've got over 1 billion people in the world who have disabilities so when we just think about the diversity of our world and who we're trying to reach it just makes absolute sense that we would have a diverse workforce who's reflecting that so that we can build and you know provide the best product and solutions that we can to to the people we're selling to and serving um and i think it also brings into play who we want to hire so the more diverse and inclusive we are as companies and we've done a massive amount of work around allyship actually in, in microsoft it means the more innovative we can be because we've got all of the styles and the different um, perspectives at the table, the more profitable we can be, but also the better we can be at attracting and retaining top talent. And I think that's super important as well. We've seen some really interesting um, statistics around particularly millennials and people who are earlier in career. And 75% of millennial employees said they would leave an organization that doesn't prioritize diversity and inclusion. So there you go, you know, just in terms of having that, because of course we need a diverse set of people working for us from early in career to later in career, technical, non-technical, it has to be a mix. But I think some of those things are really important for us to actually recognize and think properly about. We also see millennials don't stay long. They'll move very easily, very fluidly. And of course, there's a whole talent war going on and there's the, the great reshuffle. So again, in terms of how much it costs to actually have that change in employees and losing people every couple of years, at Microsoft, we know the cost of losing and replacing just one employee is $265,000. So when you think about that in line with obviously wanting to try and train and develop and retain people, it just makes absolute sense that we try and bring that diversity into the organization. And that you can do that as well in your recruitment, can't you? The language you use when you're um, when you're recruiting um, makes a, makes a big difference, doesn't it? And even things like you know, I always try and bring it back to basics. So, for example, making sure that you have an equal pipe when it comes to pipelining. You may not necessarily always have a, a female ending up in the role, of course, and you need that diversity as well. But at least if we all agree. And that might mean I need to hold on another month before I can actually go to interview stage because I don't have the right quality pipe. I think they're the type of things that we need to be looking at as leaders and role modeling and making sure that we're creating space for. Absolutely. Would anyone else like to come in on that one? I maybe just add one one comment on that. We've done a bit of research in this area as well, Sarah, and I think there was a great Harvard Business Review recently done on showed that um, diverse teams outperform non-diverse by 36%, which is a great stat. But the, the one that really captured my attention was that they're also 70% more likely to capture new market share. So mm -hmm. linking it to growth um, and, 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 you know, business performance. And uh, we're spending quite a lot of time on someone, I think, for you, know, you just talked about the war for talent, you know, it's um, so the retention of, of talent is critical. But actually what I'm finding when we're looking to attract talent is, people really do care around what, what is the makeup of your board? What is the makeup of your exec? Liz, you talk about diversity. How many role models have you got in your team, et cetera? The amount of questions you start to get and actually from quite mem junior members of the team. Um, so I think people are really interested in this. I think it also leads to, I've been talking quite a lot about the S in ESG. So, you know, the, the social kind of aspects of, 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 of diversity and, and how that, you know, inclusivity is just such an attractive um, 
part of what, what drives people getting up and working at the place they work at. They want to understand the purpose of, of the organization. And if they don't, that can switch them off, um, switch them off quite quickly. And I think here there's what Microsoft are doing this area, I think is 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 really is really powerful. We need some organizations like that that are talking about it in, in the way in the way you are. Mm. It's interesting because it's changed so much, hasn't it? Because again, when I when I started out, you took the job that offered you the most money. It was as simple as that. But now I know when my eldest daughter was looking at which engineering firm to to join, she looked. The, the salary was all pretty similar, but she looked at what their ESG was. She looked at what their progression was, what their makeup was before yeah. she chose where she went, and she has stayed there because mm. they have they have progressed with it. So true. Um, so they, they they are doing the right thing and they're keeping the talent mm. and. There's also figures. I'm, I'm rubbish at figures. M numbers are not my 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 um, strong point, so I'm, I can't remember figures exactly. But I I know that everyone I speak to says if you get a female engineer into your firm, they will stay and they will progress and they will be good because they have to fight to get there mm -hmm. because engineering is not the the route that's assumed to go. For all, yeah. Whereas a lot of men, if they're good at maths and good at physics, they become engineers. Mm. So you can really benefit, can't you? I think this concept as well of purpose-led organizations is becoming more and more important. And that's what people coming out of university care more and more about. They care about sustainability. They care about things that matter for our world. And they want to work somewhere where they're going to be able to see that impact and that connection. Um, and, I, and I think it's so important it, to, to be able to have that as a, an organization. Another overall angle on that as well is, is investors. So at the moment, women don't invest at the same rate as men, but very soon we will be. And with the 100 year life, you know, we live longer, we're becoming more financially independent around the world. And the language that financial services use in investment management isn't currently attracting women, but the industry is waking up to that. And we have, um, we've just done a big new piece of research with BNY Mellon called the Pathway to Prosperity that shows that women are much more likely to care about ESG. They're much more likely to care if you've got a diverse board. And if women invested at the same rate as men, there are trillions, hundreds of trillions of dollars would be flowing into ESG purpose-led companies that you're talking about, and also to sort of good causes and supporting sort of um, mitigation of climate change as well. And Eva, as, sorry, Eva, as our international um, representative, what would you like to add? Well, it's interesting because uh, I, I wrote an op-ed uh, um, not that long ago on uh, on changing the ROI, um, the return on investments based on, uh, you know, the, the return on investments previously has been measured on profits only. Whilst, you know, if you are to invest now in uh, in the future uh, and on in climate solutions and, and, um, uh, and human livelihoods, uh, basically then you need to have a ROI that states that success is also measured by impact on people's lives and on, uh, sorry, it's just my, hang on. Just to prove we're live. Yeah, um, and it was just the, the, the account, um, on the impacts and not just uh, profits. But the interesting thing is that when we looked at the research for venture capitals, they, uh, when they were asked questions uh, to to men, they were asking promotional questions. You know, how can, how big can this get, right? Uh, whilst if they ask questions to women, then they were asking the question, well, how you know, preventing questions. How can you uh, keep the customers that you have? And the interesting thing is that uh, just uh, I think just two percent. Uh, can't quite remember, but two percent of the VC companies in the US uh, were funded, but they were uh, female-led, whilst the, most of the others were, were male-led, but they had kind of the same uh, basics. So, uh, so it's, but the, the other part of that research just show that the, the venture capitals, they, uh, even though they had female leaders in the venture capital, the, the female leader also asked the same questions to the men. So it, it, they weren't, you know, biased to um, uh, at all. So it's it's kind of interesting to see uh, how this um, established truths that we have within that industry as well is, is still, you know, hasn't changed that much, but it is changing. 
Yeah, so it's how we use our language and how other people around us use our language to encourage everyone to be forging forward, not to just be maintaining the status quo and realising that women are just as much in a powerful position to move forward as men are. Yes, but, but, but it's, it's also about, you know, addressing and, and reflecting on how, uh, how do I talk to you versus mm. how do I talk to you, just because it's a different in gender. Um, and it's two completely different questions being asked. Uh, and that in itself is, is you know, an awakening. Uh, and I think that um, it, it, you can't impose people to change the patterns, but they need to be aware of the problem before you can solve the problem. So absolutely. Part of the problem. OK, let's move. I've got a, a really good question here. Um, what from Richard? What do you do as leaders to sustain psychological safe environments at work? Um, to break through some of these barriers and what are you doing to educate around health menopause for example um i can go on that one i'll start off on that one if you like i think as far as menopause goes um, which is something i'm going through very hotly um it's just normalizing it and talking about it and i've been in meetings that i've been chairing and i've had a hot flush and my hair goes from that to that very very quickly and i just have to get out of the room so i would just say grab yourselves a coffee, I need 10 minutes, I'm going to go outside and cool down, then we'll carry on. And we're in my head now. And I find that the world does not implode, but people are perfectly happy to do that. And by people at our level saying things like that, it becomes normalised and admitting that sometimes your brain is a bit fuzzy, but you can still operate perfectly well, thank you very much, is, is well worth doing and just normalising the whole thing and bringing it into vocabulary. But it is a thing and it's not going to stop me working. Um, I sometimes need to have um, time out for 10 minutes, half an hour sometimes to just regroup and get my brain working again. But it's just there and it's a fact of life. And it's what a, a, a lot of your employees are going to go through. So feeding that through. Has anyone got anything to add to that? Liz, you're doing some good nodding there. Yeah, no, I mean, it's quite top of mind for me at the moment, also going through it as well, Sarah, but it's um, it's more, we had a, a fascinating meeting of our um, female partners. Um, this is across KPMG, so not just in my part of the business, um, a couple of months ago on this topic. And I was, I was fascinated because A, there was a number of people in that room who'd never had a conversation about it with work colleagues. Um, and, and these are the leaders of the business, yeah? Um, and, and we brought someone in, a specialist who, who deals with it and deals with, you know, um, you know, as, as providing advice, etc. But one of the things that, that she said, which I have to say I talked to my partners about previously, was let's not forget, most of us, a lot of us are married. Yeah? A, lot, a lot of us husbands work in, in, in careers and work with females. They actually, if you raise it, they're not as embarrassed as people think mm -hmm. they are. They are. In fact, I, I know now there's quite a lot of men who are, you know, our, our CEO, John, has, has raised it in meetings um, across the board and execs. He's got a lot of females in that meeting, not in a, you know, how are you all doing, but just he finds a way of not making it a taboo subject. So mm. I think your point, Sarah, is a brilliant one around how we normalise it and how we give people, coming back to Richard's question about the psychological safety point, find um, safe environments to have those conversations, but then to help them think differently about what is, a, what is something that, you know, half the population are going to go through. Exactly. And if you don't manage it appropriately, you're in danger of losing really talented, <coughs> exactly. experienced people yeah. who just find they, they can't carry on. Uh, Freda, yeah. did you want to come in? Yeah, look, I guess more broadening it out, because there, there is there is just so many different things that people are going through and even more magnified in the last couple of years. So I think in terms of general practice, and I did pop a couple of things in the chat, Richard, from what we're doing in Microsoft, but just in general, having that sense of a check-in with people when you're kicking off a meeting and taking just a little bit of time to say, you know, how are you? And is there anything that's getting in your way that might be distracting you as we get into the next hour or two? And giving people that space to say, well, actually it's this or it's that, um, I, I think the more and more understanding we have, the easier, like you say, to normalize it and talk about it is, is important. Um, and I think the other thing is we've been doing a lot of work around Amy Edmondson's concept of the fearless organization. Um, I don't know if you if you're familiar with her, but again, it's about it's about making space and allowing people to challenge openly and it not to have a massive consequence. So really, I think it's about how we react as leaders and how we role model and challenge ourselves in those open spaces that can help bring the rest of the organization together. 
Okay, lovely. Thank you very much. Right. So, as I said at the beginning, women love stories, and we like to we like to hear about um, people's experiences. So, and we've also talked a lot about how mentoring is so important and being available to mentor. So, what what advice would you give to a young woman coming through now into your business? from what you've learned coming through. So I'll start with Fiona, who's you're my big picture at the moment. Yeah, uh, look, you know what? The first piece of advice, and I know that this is um, maybe uh, less inspirational, but important, start a pension as soon as you can and never sell your shares. If somebody had told me those two pieces of advice when I was in my early twenties, I would be, you know, sitting in Barbados writing a book. Um, so I, I think, you know, just really do, and, and it's to your point, um, I think, Claire, you were saying about the investing and, and women investing. To be honest, it's something I have just never really gotten educated on personally, and I wish I had sooner. So my, my first piece of advice is that practical piece of advice. Go and learn how to manage your finances and take an interest in that. You don't, it, it's not about necessarily... Um, aspiring to be, you know, the billionaire, but just to make sure that you don't have to worry about that so that you can focus on what you're really passionate about. And that's probably my second, my second point. Um, it took me quite a while in, in my life to actually figure out what was I really passionate about. Um, and I got very involved in coaching about 12 years ago. And it's something that I've invested heavily in both myself for learning, um, but also in, in spending my time in that space. And I think if you can figure out what you're passionate about and then try and bring it into your day-to-day -day work, the easier it's going to be to get out of bed every morning and to make sure that you really are passionate and, and interested in what you do. Um, I do think that we are in a world of lifelong learning. I do think that it's really important to take time to develop yourself, whether that's technically, whether that's soft skills. And when you think about where technology has brought us today, the fact that you can get up and listen to a podcast cast walking to work, you can do online courses, things like LinkedIn learning, the availability and accessibility to us has never been so good as it is today. So I think one thing that gets in our own way is just not creating the time and space to do that. And I would really encourage everybody to make sure that you are taking some time out to continuously learn. Um, I think the other thing is, you know, just don't stay around people who are bringing you down. Or if there's an environment where you don't feel you can be yourself or your best self, really make changes sooner rather than later. I think we often know these things a lot sooner than we, than we take action. And I think we often find ourselves saying, you know, how long have you been working with somebody that just hasn't been good for you? Um, and it may be two years, but when did you know that? About a month into the relationship. So, you know, what can we do to take action a bit sooner around things that are negative for us in our environment is really important. Um, That's a really good piece of advice and one I should have taken lots of times. Yeah, it is. And it, it's sometimes hard to do, but I think we've got mm. to figure out how to navigate it. Um, and the last thing is, look, speak up, I think. I, I Often when I talk to people, and particularly in mentoring and coaching, um, you know, you say to people, what do you want? What, what do you want? Just verbalize what would you like to happen? And often people are clear, but they won't have asked for it. They won't have been clear to say, here is what I would really like as a next step, or here is where I'm trying to get to. And so I just really encourage people to have those conversations and say what you want. And I certainly have found in my career, moving across geography, different functions, different you know, companies, that being clear and saying, here's what, I, here's what I would like, even if you don't get the answer you want, even if somebody will say to you, look, you know what, you're not ready right now. Here's what I think you need to do to be ready. At least you get some answers and you can then follow a path. So there's some of the things that I would just encourage us to, to think about. Fantastic. Thank you. Eva, come to you next. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I, I think a good piece of advice uh, would be to, you know, we live in, <clears throat> pardon, we, we live in a world where yeah, as a world of perfection you know, we always strive to be you know this perfect uh this perfect person in in all the aspects and we try to do everything 100 percent and i have an 80 year old and i can still see you know contours of how uh, how her life will be and 
you know, it's it's Instagram and it's well not yet though, but I can see how it will turn out to be. But it's you know this constant bash on on filters, you know, it, it filters that we don't look pretty enough, so we have to wear a filter in order in order to you know to to post a picture. Uh, it's all these filters of uh, unrealistic expectations uh, that is just consuming people's minds uh, and especially girls. Um, and so being yourself these days are simply not good enough. Um, so I've learned that, um, you know, I, I've never been afraid to state my opinion, uh, but I learned that um, I was not afraid that people did not like me for voicing my honest opinion about matters. Uh, but I did, however, care that they respected me. So, but being liked uh, reflects on your self image, you know, uh, it's the person that we want others to think that we are, or the person that society expects us to be, uh, which is basically perfect. Uh, but being respected versus being liked, I strongly believe it reflects on one's self worth. So our core integrity as a unique human being. And when faced with challenges and turbulence and storms throughout our lives, which everyone has and in business and, and in life in general, you will stand so much more firmly and sturdy over time because you have that strong inner core, which is called integrity. So if you are only focusing on being liked by everyone, then you know you will blow away in every in, in the very first storms, you know, like leaves. And so your integrity is kind of the stem of the tree, but it needs to be solid and stay firm. So I hope that, uh, you know, we, we have to take off all the filters and all the unrealistic expectations because it's not about being liked, but it's about re being respected. And so if you're respected, then you can stay, you know, uh, you can build on your self-worth yeah. uh, um, as well. Great, thank you. Liz? Yeah, look, I think there's been some great points already made, so I won't I repeat them because I, I relate to them. I often talk about finding your voice, be clear what matters to you and what you're passionate about, which which Fiona talked about. Um, I, I often say to to um, female colleagues, you know, who are going through tough times because they're managing so many things inside and outside of work, just be kind to yourself. Yeah. Um, we'll have all said that many times, but um, and 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 that's but but then be practical about it. So if there are specific things that you and I'm dealing, I'm working with through a few, doing a bit of mentorship with two colleagues at the moment, and they both need slightly different things. But my job is to find them the right uh, mentor. The, the, everyone's pretty much been through most things, um, but people have got to speak up and be clear on what it is they're looking for. So be kind to yourself really think about what you want to, to, to use Fiona's language from before. And then actually let's fit you with that allyship. So I'm a big believer is if you, if you can't see, um, you, you know, you can't be what you can't see, but, 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 but ask for it. And then generally we will, um, we'll, we will be able to, with the networks we all have to, to help people through those things and, and just be kind, be kind to ourselves. Life is, life is complex. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm going to ask Claire a slightly different question, so I'm, I'm, I'm dropping her in it. Um, so Claire, if you could challenge leadership to make two practical and tangible commitments, what would they be? The first would be to um, actually measure the diversity of their language, their spokespeople, their leaders, there's a massive gap. So to actually measure the gap. So rather than stating flowery commitments to actually, uh, somebody was talking the other day about make it like a sales target. Within, within three years, we will be delivering this and it will be reflected like this in our workforce. For example, Accenture set very clear targets for 50-50 equality in its workforce, that kind of thing. So I'd like to see tangible goals and tangible measurement in language. And the second thing I would like to see is, and I think this is going to be up to women, is for us to stop being, I, th I think there's a lot of kind of taking it and moving on. You know, we just eye roll and carry on. We're quite resilient. And I think we have to call out bad behavior a lot more. It's really, really difficult to do, but I think we're going to have to take a deep breath and say what's not okay because yeah we can take it and move on but for the next generation we don't want them to be putting up with this inequality so I think we're also going to have to ask everyone male and female to kind of call out in a very nice and gentle way you know what's not right and what we can do about it 
Fantastic. Thank you very much. OK, so just to, to finish off, obviously, we focus on language, fully, fully appreciate there's so much else. There's infrastructure. Childcare is part of the infrastructure of our country that needs to be sorted out. Um, there is comms. There's hybrid working. There are so many different things that are very important to in, ensuring that women have a fair role in the workplace. But language is so important. So this is why we really wanted to focus on this today, not taking away from anything else. But I think I've, I've been challenged a lot this week about why this is so important, why I think we, we should be focusing on this at such a time. And my answer is, if not now, when? Going back to, um, it was Claire, you're, you had the, the TUC thing, didn't you? Um, still, yes, still change has not yet happened. Um, and the thing that really struck it home for me was I was, talk, I was at a property conference, um, not sorry, property dinner in Manchester on Thursday surrounded by men, because men is, is property, and talking about the chair, chairman thing. And so many men, without prompting, introducing to myself, introduced me to, introduced themselves to me as chair. So they get it, they get that language is important. And I was chatting to um, uh, one of the younger employees at the Manchester Chamber about this whole thing, who's a very confident woman and she's doing great stuff. But she said to me, if I saw a role advertised, and it said something man, chairman, or whatever it was, man, I would assume that was not the role for me and I would not apply. And this isn't a snowflake, this isn't some you know, millennial, this is, a, this is a really sensible, intelligent woman, but the language still is important to her and we have to keep making sure we evolve and we change. So we will stand by this and we will pursue it. So thank you very much for joining us today. I've really enjoyed it. And just a reminder, you need to do these things. So women that are watching think they can't do it. I've got my phone here, I've got WhatsApp, I've got my notes, I'm following the, um, the uh, questions and I've got support and it is hard, but it's good and it's worth doing. So go out there and challenge yourself and do these things because we will all benefit from it. Um, so I'd like to thank my fantastic panelists today, Claire, Ava, Liz and Fiona. Thank you very much for your time and to our audience, Thank you so much for joining, joining us. Enjoy International Women's Day and go away and do something powerful and inspiring with your day today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.